when the Lord Jesus Christ says, Now the Son of Man will be glorified. He starts at the cross. He cannot and will not separate the the cross from the empty tomb. He goes to the cross and he says, This is the greatest manifestation of the glory of Christ on earth. The suffering, the accomplishment of Calvary. So Christ gloried in the cross. Second thing I want you to notice is this. That he gloried in the cross with very good reason. Now the cross was a cross of shame. Remember, and I have tried to make this point, that it sounds somewhat crass, I suppose, to put it this way. But the cross was not a little bit of gold jewelry that women with more money than sense hang around their neck. Or that men with even less sense hang around their neck. The cross is not a bit of jewelry. The cross is not some stylized little thing that really means nothing except to take away the bare look of a neck that might be better covered other ways. I mean, you would think, and others would think even more, that you were crazy if you were to run around with a little gold chain and the electric chair hung from it. Or if you were to take the gallows that throughout English history were so often used to hang people by the neck until they were dead. It would be a strange bit of jewelry, would it not? That's the cross. It's the gallows. It's an instrument of the most horrific Death that man could invent. And the Lord Jesus Christ looked on this cross of shame. The place of the curse, it was a shame. But it was also a curse because the Old Testament had placed the curse on anyone who hangs upon the tree. And he says, there is my glory. For many reasons, it was an appointed death. This is why he came. Here's the glory of the cross. Far from being an afterthought. Far from being some parenthetical insertion into the purpose of God, as dispensationalism would tell us. It is the very heart of the eternal purpose of the eternal God that before the hills were ever created, or before planets were ever flung into space, before an angel's wing was ever made to stir the ether, God in solitary majesty planned the cross of Jesus Christ. Christ could glory in this appointed death. Peter says he was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world. It was manifest in these last times for you who by him do believe in God. He could rejoice in the cross and glory in it because it was an accomplished death. And I use the word deliberately because on the Mount of Transfiguration when he spoke of his death to Moses and Elias, we're told they appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should, literally, which he was about to accomplish. Strange language, is it not? You don't talk about accomplishing your death. Why? Because when death comes to you or me, we are victims of death. Death does the accomplishing, and we are overcome by it. But when Christ died, he is the one who says, no man takes my life from me. 
I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it up again. So he talks about giving himself for his sheep. This is an, a death in the eternal appointment and purpose of God for the redemption of his people, for the salvation of his church, for the populating of heaven. And he says, I glory in the cross because this is the death that accomplishes everything that I set out to accomplish. Because it's an atoning death. He came not to be ministered unto, but to minister and to give His life an atonement or a ransom for many. An atoning death. Oh, with good reason, He could glory in the cross. You look at the whole life of Christ and it shows you the glory of His character. But when you look at the cross, there it comes into gloriously clear focus. You see the patience of the Lord, the love of Christ to His Father and to sinners, the utter selflessness of the Savior, and even in being crucified in physical weakness, His mighty power. There are many things you could say about the glorious character of Christ revealed at the cross. Perhaps the easiest way for me to sum it up would be to do a little stealing here. But I'm not stealing or plagiarizing when I uh, draw your attention to it. I was reading just last night, and I said, well, now that, that sums up all that I want to say without me going through all that I was going to say, and it will maybe let folk get back for their lunch without going too long. I was reading Horatius Bonner on John 12 and 32. And uh, he was speaking of the magnetic power of the Lord Jesus Christ when he said, I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto me. He's talking about the magnetic power of the Lord Jesus Christ. And he talked about how suitable this was to draw sinners to Christ. Why it drew sinners to Christ. Why the cross had such drawing power to draw men to Christ. And he gave five reasons. And I think when I looked at them, I said, you know, those are the very things that demonstrate the glorious character of the Savior. You look at the cross and you will see first the love which it embodies. Do you want to know what it means? When Paul could say the Son of God loved me, he went on to say he gave himself for me. You see the love of Christ in coming into the world. You see the love of Christ in going into the poorest circumstances in the world. You see the love of Christ in remaining in the world. You see the love of Christ in enduring all the contradiction of sinners throughout his life in the world. You see the love of Christ in going after the leper, touching the untouchable and making him clean. You see the love of Christ in speaking to the harlot and speaking peace and pardon and purity to her divine body and soul. You see the love of Christ in feeding the hungry. You see the love of Christ in wiping the tears from a a tear-stained mother's face and giving her back her son from the coffin. You see the love of Christ in a multitude of ways, but all oh, when you get to the cross, all those manifestations of the love of the Lord Jesus, if I may say it reverently, they peel into utter insignificance as the Lamb of God is hoisted between heaven and earth to bear all the wrath of God that was our due. And there willingly, not just to die, but to offer himself, actively to present himself in the shedding of his blood, to save his vilest enemies from their deserved punishment and reconcile their souls to God. Oh, what love is this? At Calvary, the cross embodies the love of Christ. There in the cross you will see the righteousness that it exhibits. And I'm speaking of the righteousness of Christ here. The righteousness of the Lord Jesus. Here He is dying for sin. But how can He die for sin? How can He take the sin of others? Because He stands here as the one who did no sin, who knew no sin in whom there was no sin, the holy, harmless, undefiled, and spotless Lamb of God. 
as John calls him in 1 John chapter 2, Jesus Christ, the righteous one. You see the righteousness of Christ throughout his life. Never man spake like this man. Never man lived like this man. No man could even approach to him. Not Moses, not Ezra, the two greatest figures according to the Jews in their history. Not Abraham, not David, not even Joseph, that purest of men. None of them could approach the absolute purity and righteousness of the life of the Lord Jesus. But do you want to see his righteousness fully exhibited? Then go to the cross. And as the object of human derision, scorn and shame, see him bear our sins. The sinless dying for the sinful. You'll see the glory of the cross because of the truth which it proclaims. It's interesting to me that in this connection later on as we were reading Jesus spoke of himself as the light. Verses 35 and 36. At the cross God was testifying to that light. Even as he shrouded the world in darkness he was proclaiming the glory of his Son. It's as if at Calvary God was saying, Hear him. You remember he had actually used those words once before in the Mount of Transfiguration privately to Peter, James, and John when he said, This is my beloved Son. Hear ye him. Now by his actions rather than by his utterances, he's making the same statement because at the cross you will see the truth of God in Jesus Christ, who said, I am the truth. What truth is this? What truth is it that is supremely revealed at Calvary? It is the truth of God's saving purpose in Christ. It's the truth of every fulfilled promise of the Old Testament, every fulfilled prophecy. It's the truth that Christ had been announcing and emphasizing throughout his earthly ministry. It's the truth that takes all attention and focuses on Jesus Christ himself. The one way to get right with God. The one way of life eternal. Here you find light Spiritually, without darkness. Truth, without error. Here you have the concentration of all the light of Scripture. All the light of prophecy. You have it concentrated on this one point. The cross of Jesus Christ. 